All right, we'll begin here. All right, so this is this is their sigil. This is their symbol right here. This is their talisman. This is their magic. All right. All right, so let's go to the cover of this book right here. And we touched on this before, Egyptian, Egyptian Yoga by Brother Muata Ashby and edited by Karen Clark Ashby. Uh, if you can get a copy of this, try to get a copy of it, Egyptian, Egyptian Yoga, all right? Okay, so let's um go into this. So, okay, now this is a particular section that we found to be interesting, so I just particular book of ours is kind of coming apart here. Well, I want to first of all just show you this. Have you have you just recall this? We don't have a closer upper that we can, a, a more closer upper picture, but you can see it out there. Now, which eye, the so-called, according to Mohammed, the Dajula, right? And see, he said that no other prophet revealed this. And perhaps this is what was hidden in translation concerning um, the Tisre Asa or Zakariah or Zakarias, Zachariah's book, as he points to Zechariah 5 and 6. Now, 5 and 6 together, if you add, remember, all is number, 5 and 6 is 11. The chapter has 11. In the 11th verse, it mentions um, Shinar. And we know that Shinar is that land in which they built the tower, or some will say ancient Babylon. Now, let's deal with this issue about the eye. Now, many people say it's the eye of Horus, right? It's the eye of Horus. But you know there's, a, there's the eye of Ra, Re, and then there is the eye of Heru, or Horus, the Cherui, Cherui, which is Ethiopic, which means the chosen one. So in the Ethiopic Bible, Christ, the name or his title will be the chosen one or the Cheru. And the chosen ones, the ones who many are called few are chosen, but those who are chosen are the Cheruyan. Now, this book here, it breaks down a lot of the symbolism, but from a, I would say, from a black mind. So a lot of that whitewashing is, is, is expunged, so we can really see it from the point of view that we should be looking at. So a lot of this misinformation that's out there, you know what I'm saying? A lot of this misinformation that's out there is, is a large part of the problem. So some of it is hype because it makes you believe. It gives you a little bit, but then they spin it. So here we're learning the difference between the eye of Ra and the eye of Horus. Let's just go to this this um, next page here. Now, you, as you can see right here, this is the way it's usually seen in ancient Egypt, right, in the earliest portions of Egypt, right? Now, if you know the story behind... Um, the eye, according to ancient Egypt, right, the Chemites, right, if you know the story concerning the eye and, and the, the pedophilic homosexual rape of, of, of Horus, or Horus being raped by his, his evil uncle, you know what I'm saying? Horus being raped by his evil uncle, and in the process um, Horus's eye was torn out, but but uh, Seth or Shait Sutan's testicle was ripped off. So basically, in this in this war between good and evil, the good lost a portion of his eye, right? Which was repaired by Tahuti. You understand? Know by by wisdom, we can say, repaired that eye that he had lost. Now that's where we get the one eye in that sense, in ancient Egypt. But according to the legend, according to the, their religion, their story, their testimony, that eye was repaired. Now, foreigners came in, and we learned this from the scripture concerning the stork and the woman in the measure, how she's taken out to Babylon. Now, when um, e ancient Egypt was um, taken over by the Assyrians, or when the Assyrians had, had come in, in fact, there's a cryptic verse in Isaiah which says that it was the Assyrians who persecuted God's people. But then we would say, well, what about the Egyptians? You have to notice that everybody came into this ancient Egyptian culture, as we see right here. This is the eyes, they say the eyes of the chosen, the Kharui. Then we go down here, we could break down, that's where algebra comes from. 
So this symbol that's often derided actually taught the Europeans algebra right here. So you can see breaking down the parts of this, we got the one half, the one fourth, the what was that the one um eighth, the one sixteenth, the one thirty second, and the one sixty fourth. So the ancient our ancient ancestors, that first colony of ancient Egypt, they knew what? They knew math. Remember, number is all. So we can see right in here what it say, what, what it's saying to us, when the parts of the eye of Horus, what's called the widget or the ujat, the ujat or the widget, um, widget, right, left eye is, is added up, the result is 63, 64 which approximates the whole number one. It approximates, it comes, this is when you hear about the pi and phi. This, this is that whole thing about that movie pi, right? It approximates the whole number of one. As long as the soul is involved in creation or matter, there will remain some small separation between the individual ba and the universal ba, the one. One can look at that from a Christological, biblical, or Hebrew Torah as between the, one would say, the, the, the soul or the soul of man or his spirit and God's spirit. You understand? The one. And now Tawahido is very interesting as a theology. You understand? Basically correcting the systemic anomaly. So even the Egyptians understood or overstood this. It's just that they were not able to overcome it, but they saw the chosen, the perfect chosen. This is when we talk about ancient Egypt was like, was like pre-Christianity in a sense. If you, if you can receive it from its origination. But if you get caught up in whitewash, basically what, what you're going to get is something like this. You understand? You're going to get this, this eye right here. You almost never see, let's see if we can bring this around. You almost never, so we can point to the Lord, you, you almost never see this. This image, this symbol, you don't see this symbol, or I, you don't see one of these, right, or one of these, or one of these, you understand, in a triangle in ancient Egypt. You can't go to the wall, per, the, the, the wall paintings, the monuments, nowhere. What you often see is two eyes. But see, a lot of these guys making this, these videos saying, oh, that's ancient Egypt. All they're doing is rip it, rip it and repeat basically. But if you want to really get to the truth, you know what I'm saying, you've got to study and show yourself approved. So you really recognize that something happened between ancient Egypt where that I, according to legend, that the evil brother, Sut, Shet, or Satan, ripped out of the chosen that was repaired by Tehuti or by wisdom, which Christ in the Ethiopic identifies himself with Tehuti, and Moses is also of this particular order of Tehuti, because Tehut in Ge'ez and Amharic means humble. You know what I'm saying? It means humble or humility. This is an interesting key, too. That's a virtue. That's an attribute. But anyway, so all cultures came into Egypt. This is just the latest, the latest that came into Egypt and, and has been using this particular, something derived from this particular so-called magic, right? Now, when you go over here, you see this is the right eye. Now, on this particular dollar, it's very clear that it's the left eye. If you get a close-up, if you do some research into it, most have indicated this is likely to be a left eye. Mohammed said that, that the Antichrist, the Dajala, or the Dajjal, would be blind in his right eye, but he would have a left eye. Now, you notice that right there? That's a left eye. That's what's on your dollar right there. You understand? Your almighty. Is that your almighty? Not our almighty. But here's the right eye. The right eye of Horus is also the eye of Re. The eye of Re is also, they say, uh, or Hathor in her fiery destructive aspect. Now, we're going to get a little bit more into this by just showing you some of the other the other um, symbology. And all this has meaning. The Hebrews, Moses, understood this meaning because of what had happened in, you see, the bondage in ancient Egypt, not slavery, but the bondage was a religious bondage. There were those who were 
initiated within, so they saw these things esoterically. But the people, you understand, who were unlettered, unlearned, they looked at a lot of these things and it was sold to them, like your prosperity pimps, it was sold to them exoterically. And that's where the bondage came in. They had the truth, but it had been, it had been, um, it had been distorted. It, 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 they were deceived. They, they took the truth of this, but not telling the people the, the, the true meaning of it to be free, told them enough to keep them in like a frozen psychological or soul state. Now we can see that different cultures, like right here we have, we have the eye of um, Chris, Krishna, right, with the eye of Krishna, so we can see where this originally came from right here, right? And then if we go down here, we have the eyes of Buddha or the Buddha. Buddha. Is this a link with the Buddha eye? Perhaps, perhaps. But we have the eyes of Buddha. But I want to show you that it's the eyes. It's the eyes. Now, I know some might point to where Christ is said to say in the translation about your eye be single. But he, he never said your eye be single. He said if your eye be healthy. And we're going to touch on that too. The word health is very, very important. Now, let's just go through a little bit of this right here. So the eye of, of Ra or the eye of Ray. The eye of Ray, the so-called Uraeus, it represents the life force power of the spirit which animates matter. The Uraeus is the right eye of fire and wrath. The right eye is the daughter of Ray, or what's known as the goddess or the attribute Echit Haru or Hathor, who commands the destructive power of the supreme spirit God. Yes, in ancient Egypt, they did have and know of the one God, the true God. The eye of the high God, Ray Cherui, or the vision of the chosen, the vision of, that would translate Ethiopically as the vision of the chosen, is the great goddess or feminine attribute of the universe, Echit Haru, in her wrathful, terrible aspect. Originally, the eye was sent out on an errand upon her, and upon her return, she found that she was replaced by a surrogate. This was the first cause of the wrath of the eye. Since then, the eye can never be permanently and completely appeased. Now remember, this is translating and understanding ancient Egypt thousands of years ago. Remember, that civilization we have it biblically basically came to a halt, but much of the wisdom from Egypt spread to other far off and neighboring lands, and we showed that a little bit early in the first part of this book. Now, the high god, or Re, which is contracted from the Ethiopic division, used the formula, let's go over here, the formula to turn the eye into a rearing cobra, which he strapped to his forehead to war off his enemies. Now, some might say, oh, man, this is just mythology, ancient Egypt, so forth and so on. But then recognize in the Bible the seraphim, you know what I'm saying, the seraphim, the cherubim, what the Bible is really describing there. Most people are looking at pudgy, fat, white babies, but the Egyptians overstood the truth, but it was symbolicalized. You know what I'm saying? If one wasn't initiated, you understand, or if one wasn't, um, brought into the fact that this is to be read esoterically and not exoterically. You know how most people look at these things and they judge it by looking at it, but they don't understand any of this. They don't understand that this is mathematics here. You understand? Know this is the beginning of algebra. You understand know that Tahuti fixing, repairing his eye is a great wisdom. But see, until they make some device like a Blackberry or something out of this ancient technology, you, you won't really recognize. You'll think like these people were so stupid, but yet they had mathematics and built pyramids, so forth and so on. What happened? Well, what happens to all, all who fall short of the glory of God? They fall and fall short, sometimes fall hard. Egypt fell hard because to whom much is given, much is required. This Uraeus head, 
ornament was also used in ancient times to protect the third eye region of the head, the third eye region of the head, right? Now, located on the forehead, let's go over here and focus on this. Now, located, located on the forehead, this particular symbol right here, between the eyebrows, it is also known as the third eye or in the Hindi, the Ajna Chakra in the Kundalini Yoga system. It can be activated by continual meditation on the area of the forehead, according to those systems. It is a symbol of the life force energy representing not only the visible warmth, fire of the sun, but also the subtle energy, the life force which animates it. But see, a lot of this is, that we're speaking about was known to the ancients. They didn't have all this distraction. So they recognized even the life force. You understand? Know like most folks are so caught up, they don't take time to even breathe. I mean, really deeply breathe and really meditate on what is life. And it's a shame that most only recognize it, so-called, like they say, when it's, when it's far too late. But it implies that the one who has mastered or what they call sublimated, the so-called sexual energy, which gives everything life. So now you have to understand that people say, oh, they were talking about sex. They were talking about sublimating. In other words, we would say regulating. In other words, having a discipline. In other words, you ride your horse. Don't let your horse ride you. In other words, developing this energy center allows us to be in contact with the invisible world of spirit and thus to see spiritually. Now, this is, this is, this is very, very important. Even the Bible, if you look throughout the, the Torah, especially in Leviticus and what we're studying and what we've been studying and reading, and you see how many different um, so-called laws or regulations of this people who had came out of Egypt. And it's obvious that before there were no laws on a lot of different type of things. You know, even don't have sex with your incest. You know, don't have sex with your near of kin, with your sisters, you know, your, your, your wife's sister. And, you know, you know, don't have the homosexual act. So wait, why did they have to give this people which before, even from the Gannett to Aden, there was never such a thing. Because they were in a society that had become degenerate, much like the society we are in. Just like the kind of laws that regulations, if you please, that we will have to have to once again restore this people to civilization. So thus the Torah studies are very important. Now, there's much more to this right here that we'd like to touch on. If you will, um, the right eye is called the burning heat of the sun. So if we look at the, at the right eye, the burning heat of the sun in the utterance, 3.16 uh, of the coffin text, the eye speaks, I am the all-seeing eye of Horus, whose apparent strikes terror, lady of slaughter, mighty one of frightfulness. Now, some will say, oh, lady of this and goddess of that, so from so on, oh, that's, that's, that's idolatry. Right? Even though we, we haven't bowed down to no idol or nothing, right? But if you look in your Bible and you study the Masoretic and even the Ethiopic, you'll find that there's an interesting use of gender. Do you know that the hand of the Lord is often made to be feminine? Even his eyes sometimes in the Bible, in the Torah, in the Tehillim, the Psalms, Mesmora Dawi, is said to be feminine. Different attributes of God are given a feminine attribute. They could be a masculine attribute by giving a feminine attribute. This is where the code now went from this, from physical representation within the Hebraic to symbolic logic or to the word, the very descriptive word, and was the packed-in word. Now, in other texts, the eye is described further. Great will be your power and mighty your majesty over the bodies of your enemies. Sounds a little bit like the Psalms when you think about it, right? They will fall howling on their faces. All mankind will cringe beneath you and your might. They will respect you when they see you in that vigorous form. This is a translation, but the essence is very, is very psalmaic. It's just like the Psalms of David. After all, the connection of the Beit Israel to Egypt and Ethiopia should be obvious by now, but the eye goes on to speak. I am, yes, I am, as a burning flame. Is, is, was Moses familiar with this? 
but also the boon companion of Array, the boon companion of the vision. I have seized the gods, the Elohim. There is no opposition to me. So even this I has problems with some gods, obviously, from the position, from the viewpoint of this I, these gods were false gods. So we see a very similar theme that even works its way out in the Bible. Now, the left eye, this is what's interesting, of Heru, or Heruy too, but here they spell it Heru, it symbolizes the power of the God of light. And that's interesting. It says that Satan transforms himself, right, into a, 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 a being of light, you know, like an Illuminati or something like that. And notice they use the left eye. Let's just bring that back into the mix. The left eye, notice it says that the left eye, right, the left eye of Heru symbolizes the power of the God of light. It implies that one has attained all the qualities as personified by Horus, that we have vanquished the enemies of Osiris. And remember, Osiris, in this sense, would be the father, and Horus would be the son vanquishing all the enemies of his father as we are to vanquish the enemies of our father, Abu Kedus. What are these enemies? The same enemies his majesty sought to, to, to vanquish, and for a time he did before the rise of the serpent again. Ignorance, egoism, selfishness, disharmony, mental agitation, etc., from ourselves. Now remember, we're looking at it, first of all, see the left and the right eye right here. We're looking at it in its original unified sense. That is well and way before we get this abomination right here, you understand, which we have spoken to prophetically, you understand, especially in Zechariah chapter 5, verse 6, and, and, and the related context, all right? So we're speaking about it in its original theology here. Now, the right eye of Horus, also known as the eye of Re, the Uraeus represents the sun, Re, spiritual energy, prana, ki. And the left eye of Horus, the moon, right, Isis, nature, mental power, understanding. At once, Horus is the synthesis of the spirit, the sun, and the body, moon. Now, are you getting something that the left eye is more related now in this sense seems to be to the moon, which is reflected light, right? The left eye is reflected light, and also left eye refers to the body in that sense. It is the power to see the way beyond spirit and matter, absolute reality. This is what Christ said, let your eye be single, in that sense of let it be whole and harmonious. But concerning this evil, we learn of the Dajjal, you understand, and from the sacred scripture that this one is blind. Even the Gnostics knew that the god of this world was a blind god. They call Sakla, a blind god, who exalted himself and said, I am, there is no other. You know, to sound just like our father, right? Now, the symbol of the two eyes of Horus is most ancient, having existed in pre-dynastic time, roughly 10,000 to 5,500 BCE. This is roughly the time of Moses about to come into the picture. Really, Abraham, we can say more, is in the picture at that time from a true um, calculation of time. It carried on over into the philosophy of Hinduism, as the eye of Krishna, and into Buddhism as the eye of Buddha. And we show this over here once again. Here is the eye of Buddha, right? And here is the eye of Krishna, and originally came from ancient Egypt, or the eye of Kheru, right? The eye of the chosen, right? Now, remember, one eye was ripped out, right? Remember, there was one eye that was ripped out, which is interesting right, according to a legend. So the eye imply a form of vision, a state of consciousness beyond ordinary human perception or spiritual. In the intervening time when Set 
had stolen Horus's eyes, he took away consciousness of a forceful... Okay, he took away... What was that? Okay, he took away Horus's... Let's see, beyond the ordinary and intervening time. Okay, he took away Horus's vision of unity. You understand? Horus's vision of unity. Remember Horus, Ethiopic, Harui, the chosen, the elect. Took away that vision of unity. That means war, chaos, disorder. Horus, therefore, saw the world as Seth did. Notice this. When he went to blind him, therefore, Horus had to see the world just as his evil uncle did. Through the state of loss, through the state of consciousness of a forceful brute. You see, we wonder why the violence is going on. Things that we one time said black people wouldn't be doing, they're doing. With unbridled emotion, passion, and egoism. Horus, you know, we could call it, we probably call it the four acting white, right? But Harui, he lost the light, the intuitional vision of the sun and was dominated by the moon or the earthly passion the earthly that do what thou wilt he, he lost uh, he lost the um make thy will obedient to good influence and instead did what thou, thou wilt in other words got caught up on animal passion which clouded the mind and impeded higher thought and vision Higher thought and intuition, and intuition right here. Therefore, Satan, which is body consciousness, vision is hostile to Ray, contracted Ethiopic Rai, spiritual vision, and must be fought against until it is controlled, and that means sublimin, sublimate, sublimated or regulated, you can say. But it must be controlled, sublimated, or regulated. As stated in the Egyptian book of the coming forth by day, put in the chapter 23, Satan, thinking, is the greatest force holding the soul in a state of bondage. You see, so there's a whole different interpretation overstanding to even the Israelites coming out of Egypt. Remember that mixed multitude was not just Israelites. There were many Egyptians who also knew the truth, true Egyptians, or the true faith. At the end of the conflict between Horus and Seth, <laughs> Seth, or brute force, arrogance, egoism, is sublimated through Tehuti, through wisdom. Remember where Christ says wisdom is justified of her children? And Tehut, like Tehit, Tehut, Tehitna, it means humility or humbleness. His physical force is directed to the service of Ray or the service of the vision as he is given the prestigious position at the head of the bark of Ray or the ship of Ray as protector of Ray, protector of the vision as he tra traverses the heavens every day. Now some say that these barks are actually these, these brothers from other planets and their ships visiting, checking on I and I state whether we've have that number. You understand? Number, all is number. Each day, a ray must do battle with the forces of darkness who would like to stop a ray from shining. They would like to stop the vision of his majesty from shining, the true light of Christ. These forces are, let's just get to this right here, these forces are headed by who? Apophis, the serpent. See how this connects to the biblical story when read correctly, not from all that whitewash mumbo jumbo. You know, saying one sate or suit or suit on shate on is controlled through wisdom, but not the wisdom of man, the wisdom of Jah. He is seen doing battle against the prophet. So once the evil uncle now, so remember, suit or sate and the prophet is not one and the same. But once he is, as it says right here, once he is controlled or sublimate, sublimated through wisdom, he is seen doing battle against Apophis in order to protect the bark of Ray. And it says, see page 58. In this manner, our physical nature, brute animal force, 
must be placed at the service of spirit. Now, there's a little bit more to this, but our main focus on this right here, and now this, if you know, this is the eye of, this is the eye of Tehuti right here. This is the eye of Tehuti. This is a symbol of a parchment scroll, which is kind of very interesting. Oh, the reasoning on that. But getting back to this right here, so the left eye, are we overstanding something about this left eye? You understand? And, 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 and this symbolic story of some can call it a two brothers story or some might see the Cain and Abel kind of story or the biblical story. But the main thing is this left eye. Why is it a left eye? I think from ancient Egypt, the secret of this will become very clear in how this also connects with what happened when he, when he ripped out his eye and therefore caused him, it's almost like, take away our birthright, our name, our nationality, call us Negroes, blacks, and coloreds, you understand? And before you know it, you understand? Before you know it, we're acting, thinking just like them. It's time to come out of this spiritual Egypt, brothers and sisters. So more to come. Stay tuned. Yah willing. Shalom. Rastafari.